Chapter 4, Section 4. This is on nucleic acids. I just want to start by saying that DNA is a truly remarkable molecule, and here's why. Think about all the diversity of life on this planet, from the bacteria that form the film on your teeth first thing in the morning, to all the different types of plants and animals in our world. All of it, every bit of it, basically shares the same DNA. What that means is the language of life is the same for everything on this planet. And it does it with only four different letters, four building blocks. Now, when it comes to nucleic acids, there are two different types. One is DNA, illustrated on your right. And DNA has one job, and that basically stores genetic information that allows you to pass it on to the next generation. And you can also direct the activities of the cell with that information stored in your DNA. The other type is RNA. There are multiple types of RNA that each serve different functions. There's messenger RNAs, transfer RNAs, and RRNAs, which is the ribosomal RNA. And we'll talk a little bit more about them later. And what you're seeing right there on the picture, that is a type of transfer RNA. And those types of RNAs are very important in the making of proteins. Okay, when I say that there are four letters used by DNA. There are five total. There's a little bit difference between DNA and RNA. But basically, DNA uses these nitrogenous bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And that thymine in green, that one's not used in RNA. And we'll come back to that again. But these are the, basically the four nitrogenous bases used to make our DNA for every living thing on this planet. When it comes to RNA, RNA and DNA share in common adenine, guanine, and cytosine, but instead of using thymine, RNA uses uracil. Nucleic acids are comprised of nucleotides. The nucleotides are the building blocks, and you see that word base up there at the top right. That base is the four, one of the four nitrogenous bases we just talked about. Now, a nucleotide has three different parts. Each nucleotide has a phosphate group attached to it. There is also a ribose or a deoxyribose sugar. Those are two different types of sugars and they're very, very similar to them and we'll come back to that difference here in a minute. So, nucleic acids, they're comprised of three parts. Your phosphate, your sugar, and one of the nitrogenous bases. Okay. Whenever we start linking nucleotides together, we form what is called a sugar phosphate backbone. That ring structure, that's your sugar, and you can see the phosphate groups attached to those sugars. So there's your sugar, there's your phosphate. Now, this part of the molecule is very hydrophilic. Do you know why? Well, you should look at all those oxygens, and you should say, oh, they're forming polar covalent bonds with phosphorus, hydrogens, and carbons. This molecule is hydrophilic because it can form hydrogen bonds with water. You may have noticed that there's numbers associated with that top sugar up there. And you can see them, one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime, and five prime. That little mark up there means prime. And that's just to separate the carbons that you would find in your base. Now, because there's numbers, you can see the five prime is up at the top and three prime is at the bottom. What that means is that this molecule, a nucleic acid, has directionality. And we would say in this case, it's going from the five prime to the three prime end. Okay, so we've got DNA and RNA. We know the general form of a nucleotide. Let's look at the differences between the two different nucleic acids. Remember, DNA is one type that stores information. RNA is another type that is very versatile. Okay, first of all, DNA uses a deoxyribose sugar. Now, I've highlighted with the arrow on that two prime carbon, there is just a hydrogen. It is missing the oxygen. So it lacks a hydroxyl group on that two prime carbon. That's actually very important for the structure and functioning of DNA. 
for first of all, it makes it very stable. And that's a good thing. You want your molecule to be stable if you're going to be storing information in it. Second, DNA uses the four bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. And the thymine is different. RNA does not use thymine. And the other thing is, DNA is double-stranded. Okay, so you can see that kind of a beige ribbon. That's the sugar phosphate backbone and it is hydrophilic. The interior is made up of the nitrogenous bases. They are less hydrophilic than the sugar phosphate backbone. So the sugar phosphate backbone interacts with water, forcing the nitrogenous bases inwards. Now the nitrogenous bases, they're forming hydrogen bonds between each other. And those hydrogen bonds are weak bonds, and they basically hold the two strands of DNA together. What that means is it's easy to separate the two strands of DNA. Now don't forget, the sugar phosphate backbone is held together by much stronger covalent bonds. There are two types of nitrogenous bases. One is called a purine, the other one is called a pyrimidine. Now this thing called Chargaff's rule, it means that pyridines are always equal to the number of purines. And here's the difference. A and G, which are adenine and guanine, are purines. And look at the molecules on your right side of your screen. That adenine and guanine, they form a double ring structure. Those are purines, and I always remember pure as gold. The pyrimidines are the thymine and the cytosine. So in any stretch of DNA, you always have a purine forming a hydrogen bond with a pyrimidine. And what that means is, 50% of your DNA will always be a purine and 50% will always be a pyrimidine. Now, when we look at these A's and T's, A forms two hydrogen bonds with thymine. You can see there's two layers of red dots. And guanine always forms three hydrogen bonds with cytosine. So what's the implications here? Okay, well, let's look at char gas rule. How can we apply this? Why is it important? Well, if I tell you I've got a piece of DNA that is 10% thymine, I know that thymine will always form two hydrogen bonds with thymine. So my am amount of thymine will always equal the amount of adenine. So if I've got 10% thymine, I've got 10% adenine, which is 20% of your DNA total. What about your GC content, your guanine and your cytosine? Well, we know that G always equals C. So I've got 80% left of my molecule. They're always equal, divide it by two, you get 40 plus 40. So that means by knowing the amount of one nucleotide, you can figure out the percentage of all the other nucleotides inside of any strand of DNA. Okay, let's go into RNA. RNA is a single-stranded molecule. Now it can fold in on itself, but it's still single-stranded. It uses the nitrogenous base uracil, which is a little bit different than thymine. And RNA uses what is called a ribose sugar. Now if you notice, a ribose sugar has the hydroxyl group on the two prime end. That makes it less stable than DNA. So the hydroxyl group on that two prime carbon of the ribose makes this molecule a little less stable. Here's why. Oxygen is electronegative. That means it's gonna pull the electrons to it. So it's forming a polar covalent bond between the oxygen and the carbon. Now, if I've got all the electrons near the oxygen, that end is gonna be negative, and then the carbons will become slightly positive. Now here's the thing, like charges repel. So those two positive charges, well it's partial charges, that's that delta symbol, means those two carbons on the two prime and three prime are slightly positively charged. So they repel each other. And because they're repelling each other, that covalent bond has more potential energy. And bonds that have more potential energy are more easy to break. We know this from everyday experiences. See, if you have natural gas and you take a match, you can easily light natural gas on fire. Natural gas is all carbon and hydrogen. It's the same thing as gasoline. And they're forming nonpolar covalent bonds. So those bonds are easy to break because they store a lot of energy. Water, on the other hand, has 
polar covalent bonds. The oxygen holds on to those electrons. You throw a match in water and it just goes out. Now stop daydreaming. I know you'd rather be in those warm tropical waters than study in this class. Okay, so ribose sugar has a hydroxyl group a little bit more reactive, a little less stable. That small difference actually has big implications. Whereas DNA stores genetic information, that's basically its only purpose. RNA is way more versatile. There's messenger RNA involved with protein synthesis. Protein synthesis means it's making proteins from amino acids. Transfer RNA, also involved with making proteins. Ribosomal RNA, also involved with making proteins. Now you notice that's in red. That means that ribosomal RNA is catalytic. And what catalytic means is that it's speeding up the rate of a reaction. And in fact, ribosomal RNA actually links two amino acids together. This is a, another type of siRNA for regulation of translation. Now we haven't really talked about translation, but that's taking genetic information and actually making the protein that occurs inside the ribosome. Am I or microRNA is involved in regulation of translation as well. There's small nuclear RNA for RNA processing. There's um, SNO RNA, SNO, for ribosomal processing. And there's small cytoplasmic for tRNA processing. So the take home message with all of those different types of RNAs is that it is incredibly versatile and is very much involved with making proteins and regulating gene expression. Now we'll get much more to gene expression later on, but gene expression is basically taking the information in DNA and making proteins out of that. So RNA is very versatile. It stores genetic information. It can catalyze chemical reactions and it regulates protein synthesis.